Sometimes we say, uh, tongue in, in kind of tongue in cheek, right? That God works in mysterious ways, right? God works in mysterious ways. This was definitely true for our influencer today. He was a, a king of um, of Judah that was became king when he was just a boy, and he was in uh, the royal line of lineage of David. Um, we're going to hop right into him, his story today, and it is a wild one. I'll just warn you right up front, it is a wild story. If you thought your family was messed up, this is going to be a great encouragement to you because as screwed up as you think your family may be, I am willing to bet that it doesn't hold a candle to how screwed up our influencer's family is. His name is Joash. Joash. Kind of an interesting name. It will be a day of interesting names. And uh, Joash, his name means Jehovah has given. And um, we don't know much uh, about really, like we know a little bit about Joash, but we do know that he was a significant person, we, a significant um, uh, boy in the lineage of David and in the lineage of, therefore, Jesus. And so today we're going to walk through his story, and it is crazy. It is a wild story of a messed up family who is in power in, uh, in Judah. Um, again, we're coming to this point where, if you kind of the history of Israel, um, after uh, King David and then King Solomon, and after King Solomon, the nation of Israel split into Israel and Judah, became the divided kingdoms, and that continued down. And in Israel, I'll just tell you, Israel had no godly kings. Judah had a few, okay? And so for the last two weeks of our Influencer Series, we're going to be talking about kings of Judah, and, uh, but there's some crossover here that's kind of a crazy way. Uh, jo uh, Joash was the son of Ahaziah. Ahaziah was the son of uh, Jehoram and his wife, um, uh, Athaliah. And Athaliah was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, uh, which made her a half Israelite, half Phoenician. And, um, and so just as I say that, you guys are like, I'm already lost. Right? So what I've done for us today, because this is one of those messages where I was in my study trying to figure all things out, and I was like, I'm lost. Right? I'm reading these names, and I'm like, I, okay, I'm lost. I need to draw out the family tree. And so what I've done for us is I've driven, draw out the family tree so that as we go through this message, we can just kind of refer to this. Okay, We have uh, Israel and Judah. These were two kingdoms, right? Um, Ahab and Jezebel. You've likely heard of them before, right? Everybody heard of Ahab, Jezebel, at least Jezebel, right? Because any kind of, she's kind of the epitome of wicked women, right? And, and even today, like, people will say, don't be a Jezebel, right? Because she epitomized wickedness. She was wicked. Her husband Ahab, wicked. Um, and so uh, their daughter, Athaliah, uh, marries Jehoshaphat's son. So we have two kingdoms happening who hated each other, by the way, who were constantly at civil war, and all of a sudden we have cross-marriage happening between the two kingdoms, Athaliah and Jehoram. Je Athaliah and Jehoram um, have a son uh, named Ahaziah and uh, his wife, Zebiah, and, uh, and then we'll get into that, but, but then they had this son, Joash. Okay, so it's already confusing, I know, but this will just help you. Every time we read names, we're going to go through a lot of scripture today. We're going to hit a lot of the story today, and you might just need to peek up at this and say, Okay, who are we talking about here? Because it gets convoluted and confused. Okay, so help. We're just going to walk through this story a little bit. Okay, Athaliah marries King Jehoram, and the Bible doesn't have much to say about Jehoram except for Jehoram kills all of his brothers. Okay, there's a lot of killing that happens in our first part of this message today. We'll just go with it. All right, 
And Jehoram, he, Jehoram, walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Again, like I said, no king of Israel was godly. They were all bad, wicked. They, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel and the house of Ahab had uh, in the ways that Ahab done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, Athaliah. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So all of a sudden we have, it's saying here, right? We have Jehoram. He did what his, he walked in the way of Ahab, not in the way of his father, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat wasn't the greatest king, but he also wasn't evil. So he kind of walked in that, but he was, he was decent. He honored God. And so Jehoram, though, says, his son says, ah, he kind of walked in the way of Ahab. Why? Because he married Ahab's daughter. And there was evil in this bloodstream, okay? Just evil, all right? And then it says this, continuing on, we jump to, down to verse 18 of 2 Chronicles 21. And after all this, the Lord struck him, Jehoram, this gets gross, just hopefully you hang on to your breakfast, struck him in his bowels with an incurable disease. In the course of time, at the end of two years, his bowels came out, because of the disease. And he died in great agony. And, and here's how much he was loved. And his people made, made no fire in his honor like the fires they made for his fathers. He was 32 when, years old when he began to reign. He reigned for eight years in Jerusalem. And, the, and he departed with no one's regret. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. So this is speaking of Jehoram, right? And how evil he was. So much so that they didn't that that when his bowels came out of his body and he died in great agony, all the people of Judah were like, "Yes, finally." Right? That's how evil he was. That's how messed up he was. We don't know a lot about him other than he killed all of his brothers so that he had no, uh, nobody uh, that could take over for him. So his son, Ahaziah, becomes king. But Ahaziah's mother, Athaliah, remained kind of this behind-the-scenes uh, behind influence in his life. Right? So we have... Uh, Ahaziah, his, his mom, Athaliah, though, she was um, kind of an evil advisor. And the Bible goes on in ch uh, chapter 22 of Second Chronicles. It says this. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah the youngest son king in his place. For the, uh, for the band of men that came with the Arabians came to the camp, and, and, to the camp had killed all all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahaziah was 32 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of or or Ori or Omri. Uh, he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor in doing wickedly. Okay, we'll pause there for just a second. So it's saying Ahaziah did what in the, walked in the way of Ahaz, not or Ahab, not in the way of his grandpa Jehoshaphat, because Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab, was counseling him. And as we've been talking about in this series, influencer, right? Influencers, we see that people have influence in our lives, and we have opportunity to be influenced in other people's lives for good or evil. And today we're going to land with, I'll just give you a heads up, we're going to land with a couple people who are great influences in Joash's life. But we see here right from the get-go that the influence of Ahab to his daughter, to, his, to, to her husband, to her, their son was evil. And when we are not intentional about being influencers for good, oftentimes the evil influences in the world easily take over, easily influence the wrong way. And so his mom was his counselor, and they, he was doing wickedly. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and the house of, uh, as the house of Ahab had done. For after the death of his father, 
They were his counselors to his undoing. Isn't that interesting? It says they were his counselors to his undoing. It goes on, if we drop down to verse 8. And when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, he met the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers who attended Ahaziah, and he killed them. He searched for Ahaziah, and he was captured while hiding in Samaria, and he was brought to Jehu and put to death. They buried him, for they said, He is the grandson of Jehoshaphat who, who sought the Lord with all of his heart. And the house of Ahaziah had no one able to rule the kingdom. Okay, so we continue on the story. Very shortly after Ahaziah, uh, Ahaziah starts to reign, it says Jehu comes through and he's finding out and he kills all the brothers and he kills Ahaziah. Now, after Ahaziah is killed, there was no one to rule in the kingdom. So guess who decides to rule in the kingdom? The queen mother, Athaliah. She's like, I guess I'll rule. Convenient, everybody else dies. Well, almost everybody else dies. She'll make sure that everybody else dies. She's convenient, right? She's like, I guess I'll take power. And then, what does she do? Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family of the house of Judah. Her son dies, and her method of grief is to say, I guess I'll take power, and then I'll go out and kill everyone who is in the line of David, in the line of Judah, who would possibly be able to take charge, who would possibly be able to reign and rule. As if all the deaths were not enough, right? She made sure that all the children in the line uh, for the throne of Judah were killed. And she did this wicked thing because she wanted to rule with complete authority, with no threat of an heir to her reign. So she decided to kill everyone in the line of David that God, that God had promised to sustain. Can you imagine can you imagine a grandmother going out and killing all of her grandchildren so that she could have power? That's what was happening here. A grandmother, Athaliah, goes out and kills all of her grandchildren just because she's on a power trip, just because she doesn't want any threat. And Athaliah takes the crown for herself she slaughters the royal heirs, or so she, all of them, or so she thought. The problem is, is that God had made a promise years before to David. We find this all the way back. We jump back in the story to 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God makes this promise directly to David. He says, And your household, and your house, and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In the midst of all this chaos in our story, when the line of David was thought to be destroyed, we read this in, in, back up in 2 Chronicles, yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. And it just brings us to kind of an observation that we make very at the very outset of this message, and it says, it's this, that God's promises will never fail, right? He promised to keep uh, David's lineage alive, and the promise continues on that the Messiah would end up coming from David's line, that the lineage of David would produce the Messiah, the, the awaited one, the Savior of the world. And yet it seemed like all hope was lost, because it was thought that everybody in the lineage of David was gone, was dead. Athaliah killed them all, or so she thought. Second Kings, we jump over to Second Kings chapter 11 where the story continues. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed the royal family. But Jehosheba, 
the daughter of King uh, Joram, the sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being put to death. And she put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Thus they hid him from Athaliah so that he was not put to death. And he remained uh, with her six years, hidden in the house of the Lord, while Athaliah reigned over the land. Fascinating, right? God had not forgotten his promise to David. And all his eyes were on this infant son of, 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 uh, Jehor- or of, of Ahaziah, Joash. And while the power-seeking Athaliah was in the act of killing all her grandkids, Jehosheba, Joash's aunt, steps in, finds this boy. And what does she do with him? She brings him into the temple. Because Je, uh, Jehoshiba, her husband, uh, Jehoiada, he was a priest in the temple. And so they bring, uh, they bring Joash. And I love what it says here. He remained there six years, hidden in the house of the Lord. Joash grew up in the temple. He grew up in the house of the Lord. He he lived in and was raised in, in and around God's people in the temple. And in the house of the Lord, he was brought up. He was raised in church, friends. In like the most, in the most like uh, literal way. He was like, he was like lived at the church, right? He lived at the temple. He lived amongst God's people. He lived in and around them. And in so doing, the lineage of David was contingent upon his life, and he was there hidden for six years. God had placed Joash in the hands of his aunt and her husband, the priest. And although Athaliah was reigning and she was doing horrific things, and she was putting up idols all over the countryside, she was raising up places where people could worship false gods and Baals, and she completely neglected the temple, and the temple began to go to, to, to ruin, essentially. Like things were falling apart at the temple because she didn't care about the God of Israel. She didn't care about God Almighty. She just cared about worshiping false and false gods and making idols to them. Well, all that was happening, Joash was being raised in the church, was being raised in the house of the Lord, was being raised in the temple. And when Joash turned seven years old, Jehoiada put uh, his, his uncle put him into a place with this. It was crazy. It was this well thought out plan that was going to take a whole lot of orchestration, organization, but he saw something in young Joash. And he knew the promise that, that God had made to David. And he knew that Joash was the last remaining boy in the lineage of David. So they, he. Uh, Sought to make him king. We drop down in our second to verse 10, 2 Kings 11. And the priest gave to the captains and the, uh, the spears and the shields that had been King David's, which were, the ho- which were in the house of the Lord. And the guard stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, from the south side of the house uh, to the north side of the house, around the altar and, and the house on behalf of the king. Then he brought out uh, the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they proclaimed him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, long live the king. Basically, they found out this. They they made this plan to make Joash king of Judah. And the priests gave out all the things that belonged to David They formed a ring all around this young boy and they proclaimed him king. Well, how do you think grandma took that? Evil grandma, right? She finds out and let's see what happens. When Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and the people, she went into the house of the Lord to the people And when she looked, there was the king standing by the pillar according to the custom. 
and the captains and the trumpeters beside the king and all the people of the land rejoicing and blowing trumpets. It was a party happening, right? Because they had just anointed a new king. And Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, treason, treason. Then Jehoiada, the priest, commanded the captains who were set over the army, bring her out between the ranks and put her to death with the sword. Anyone who follows her, for the priest said, let her not be uh, let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, and she went and she went through uh, the horse's entrance to the king's house, and there she was put to death. And Joash was just seven years old when he became king of Judah. Goes on. In the seventh year of, Je- of Jehu, Joash began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zib- uh, Zibiah of Beersheba, and Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days because of Jehoiada, the priest instructed him. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people continued to sacrifice and make offerings in the high places. We have this boy, Joash, right? And he was, he was raised in the temple. He was raised around God's people, the priests and the, the people who were serving in the temple. But it mentions his uncle by name, Jehoiada, the priest. And then that Joash did what was right. See, Joe, and it's, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. One of the greatest things uh, Joash did was he started rebuilding and repairing the temple so that God's people could begin to worship there again. He began to do and undo a lot of what his family had been doing for, for years beforehand. And because of the influence of his aunt and his uncle, Joash did some really, really, really great things for the nation of Israel, for the nation of Judah. Actually, when I was thinking about this afterwards, really, the story is not of influencer Joash. The story, actually, the influence that we're talking about is the aunt and uncle of of Jehoshiba and Jehoiada. Because they were the ones, right, that saw this evil taking place. They saw all the lineage taking, like all the evil going. They're like, we have to do something about this evil. And so they went and rescued Joash and they raised him up in the Lord. They raised him around God's people. They, they brought him in and loved on him and took care of him and discipled him and disciplined him. And then at seven years old, can you imagine this, right? Right? Can you imagine at seven years old, Jehoiada comes and he says, we have to make this, we have to make him king. I think Jehoiada knew that the time was running out. Can you imagine how many people in the temple had to be in on this in order and to keep the news that there was a lineage, there was a boy in the lineage of David, a secret in the temple for six years? Can you imagine how many people that would take so that Athaliah didn't ever find out that this boy was alive? All these people jumped in and took care of and kept this secret alive as they mentored him and raised him. But at seven years old, he became king of Judah. Now I have a seven-year-old. And although contrary to what she believes sometimes, she's not ready to run a country. Don't ask her. She might take you up on it. But seven years old, this boy becomes king. He's in no place to run run this country by himself. And what I love about this, it says, because of Jehoiada, the priest instructed him. The Jehoiada, his uncle, continues to be a godly influence in his life for year after year after year. The Jehoiada and, 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 and Jehosheba, they just continue to come around. Those people that were around him as he was being raised from birth to six years old, being raised in the temple, they had provided the foundation for him to do this. But then they continued to walk with him as he was king and continued to instruct and continued to love on and continued to give instruction to all 
along and mentor him as he grows. I don't tell you just this crazy story of this crazy family in the Old Testament just to make you feel better about maybe your family. We say all of what that, we tell this whole backstory of this crazy family that if a movie was ever made about that family, it would be bloody. It would not be rated PG, that's for sure, right? It was a mess where murder take place and people striving for power. I don't tell you all of that story just to say, well, okay, now you leave with this knowledge of this crazy family. The reason we talk about this this morning and we share this in this series is because I want us to see what kind of influence can happen in the church. What kind of influence can happen when God's people get around kids and students and decide, guess what, we're going to just love on and care for and disciple and mentor and pour into the next generation of God's people. Because this story shows us this boy at seven years old becoming king that God can use any person at any age to accomplish his person. So we who are older ought to be more, uh, we ought to be looking for more opportunities to pour into the lives of our kids and our students that are here at River Hills. We ought to look around and say, how is, who has God put around us that we can love on and pour into and raise up in the house of the Lord? Friends, we have the opportunity to do that here. And what an awesome opportunity this, this is. Joash wasn't raised by his parents, but was raised by people who loved God and poured into him and changed the story of a family it's changed the whole family tree because God's people decided to look out for him. Decided to say, you know what? We're going to love on this kid. Here's the mindset. Oh, I missed, our, I missed this live. I missed this word. I'm like, where are we at? Here we go. Here's what we're getting at today. Humble influencers teach us the value of a humble church where every child matters. Humble influencers teach us the value of a humble church. And a humble church says this, friends. uh, um, The mindset of a selfless and humble church says, I want this next generation's future to be better and brighter than mine. That's what a humble church says. That's what a humble influence says is I want for our kids and the kids that are going to come after our kids that their future, that their would be better and brighter than even what is mine. And often we ask, often we ask what's best for me now when we should be asking what's best for the next generation. What's best for my kids, my kids' kids, and their kids? And how can I be part of the solution? How can I be part of helping in in a place like this, in the house of the Lord like this, in, in the church like this? How can we collectively love on and care for and disciple and come alongside parents or come alongside kids who don't have parents who are raising them in the Lord? How can we come alongside and love on and care for them, to disciple them? Because I, I don't believe this for one second that anybody in here disagrees with what I've said today, right? I, I think everybody in here uh, agrees with that. I don't think anyone in here is like, no, let's let them all suffer, right? No, you know what? I, 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 I don't want any of these kids around, right? I, I don't believe anybody in here believes that. In fact, I don't think you last at our church unless you like kids or you want kids around. At least tolerate kids, right? Because we have a, God has, 
blessed our church with kids that are running around, that are everywhere, with students, with a student ministry that's, that's growing and thriving, with kids' classes that are exploding. Like, I believe that, that we do well here, friends, at loving our kids. And so this isn't a message of condemnation, rather a message of encouraging us to say, hey, let's continue on and do so even greater. One of the things uh, that, we, that we can do is just think to ourselves, how can we be intentional influencers in the lives of the kids that God's put in and around us here? And there's so many of you who are doing that already. I mean, I was thinking about this week, and I, I was just, in fact, I, I was sitting around um, with the guy, I, I meet with another group of, of pastors whom we sermon right together, and I was sitting around, I was just bragging on you guys, I really was. I was telling them about Grandma Judy and um, just how she's loved on our, our kids for so many years, and how she came in into a place, and, and when you guys merged with our church, right, you came from a church that didn't have a lot of kids around, and when you came in these doors, you started loving on our kids in such an intentional way that now when you walk in the door, you just get swarmed with kids, right? Yeah, because you, you just loved on them. And I was telling other pastors, just like we have this grandma who just loves on all the kids the same and pours out gifts. And I, and I was bragging about Sandy who makes treats for all of our students and, and just in her own way, just loves intentionally on our students by providing snacks for them. And, and she brings them in and she makes a special trip to Gresham from, from way out in Sandy, which is a, you know, another world out there, right? No, but she comes in and she brings snacks for our students and they, they know her and love her. As the, as, and she's not in the middle of the craziness on Wednesday nights, but she uh, facilitates it by sugaring them all up, Right? And I was telling them about all of our student leaders, Rachel and Stefan and, and Nate, who just come in, Shay this year, who come in and have supported Shannon as she loves on our students. And I was just bragging about you guys because you love on our students so well. And you guys are just one step above that, like one step one step, and then two steps, not like us who are like five steps ahead, right, in life, but you but you love on our students, and I'm so thankful for that. And I was bringing them, I couldn't say them all by name, but I, I was thinking about every one of our teachers who selflessly serve week in and week out in our student, in, in our kids' classes, in our adventure kids, who make this a place where, where kids have told their parents, we gotta get church, we gotta come to church because I wanna be part of it. I want to be part of what's happening at, in, our, in our kids' classes. And, and, and so many of you serve there and love our students well there. And I was telling them about, I was telling them about the, the prayer warriors that come up alongside and pray for our students, from Mike to Tammy to uh, I, I, Jeff and Melanie, like, I know that there, I can't even mention, I, like, I, if I always went around, I would mention every single one of your names almost, where, where you guys are loving on our kids by praying over them, right? Again, church, I'm saying, like, we are doing this well, being an influence, but we can, but what I want to say is, how can we continue to ask the question, right? How do we continue to ask the question, how can I make an intentional influence in the next generation so that they grow up in the house of the Lord, loving the house of the Lord, saying, I want to continue to come here and be part of this. It's, it's, it's Rachel and Stefan's story. They grew up in the house of the Lord, and they continue to come back and serve and love in the house of the Lord. Why? Because they were raised here, and they, they were loved by you guys, and now they get to love on. It's Shay's story who continues to come back, and even though she's graduated, she continues to come back and love it's my story, friends. I was raised in the house of the Lord, and I still love the house of the Lord. Why? Because you guys loved on me and my sisters, and now I see you love on my kids. It matters, and I'm so thankful that my kids get raised in the house of the Lord where people like you come around and love on them and intentionally influence them. 
that's the beauty of the church. And yeah, friends, I'll tell you, I'll be the first to tell you there are a lot of screwed up things that happen in church. I'll tell you that. Like, I know. But what I also know is that I've seen it when the house of the Lord comes together for the future of the next church and loves on them. And that's beautiful. So how can we continue to do this? How can we continually um, contribute intentionally to influence our kids and our students? If you're looking for a way, just, just get to know them. You see one of those kids, one of our students running around after church, why don't you stop and ask them their name? And just, just say hi to them. Sometimes it's as easy as just smiling at them. Do you realize our kids, our students don't get smile that very often anymore. They're in a world where most of the time angry things get said to them. Frowns are given to them. You know what an amazing thing can happen if we just start smiling at them? Right? And even when we have to slow them down as they're cruising through the hallways, we can do that with a smile. We can find out their names and Ask them what they're interested are. Find out what they, they're into, right? You can, we can show interest in those things. We can continue just to pray for them. We started an initiative um, right when school started of praying over our students, and many of you guys took home um, prayer sheets for each, and you kind of adopted a student for the year. Continue to pray for those, those students all throughout the year, but but maybe as God leads, rather than only praying for them, when you see them cruising around the hallways here, stop them and just let them know you're praying for them. Maybe you could just find out something little about them that would help, help you pray for them even more. Right? And, and, and trust me, friends, if you've worked in student ministry or if you've worked in kids' ministry, it's not going to be incredible conversation. I'll just warn you. Right? It's not going to be everything you looked for. It's not going to be as if heaven opens and sun rays come down and blah, right? They're probably going to mumble something and move on, right? But they'll remember. They'll remember. Because I still remember, don't you? I still remember the adults that took interest in my life, don't you? The ones that smiled at you. When you were a kid, who loved you despite all your craziness as you were a kid? The ones that poured into you when you were a kid? I don't mean to call you out because of your age, Paul, but like I remember when I was a teenager, kid, 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 I just remember snapshots, and this should be surprising to my mom because I don't remember a whole lot, but I remember snapshots of when Paul intentionally put into my life when I was a kid, and Mike the same. I remember what I was taught, and most of, more than what I was taught, I just remember that, that those guys took interest in me, and they showed me stuff. And it, if you guys remember those people from your life as you grew up, why don't you be that for somebody else? It's not that hard, but it makes a huge impact, and it can make an eternal impact in some kids' lives. Our job often is just to make space, just to make space for our kids and our students, to make a place where they feel at home in the house of the Lord, where they feel welcomed and loved on here in this place. And we can do that. We, we do that. We can do it even better. We can be that place. I'll wrap up with this story. I read this in a book, and um, I don't remember the author's name, but he, was, um, he had gone to a church, and this church was kind of fractured, and the older generation was just complaining about the young people in the church. So clearly he wasn't talking about our church because we don't have this issue. But he was at this church. He was advising this church, and he looked out over all these, this older generation, and he said, you guys have grandkids? 
And he's like, yeah, yeah, we have grandkids. And he's like, well, what would you be willing to do for your grandkids? Would you, do, do, you like to get, do you like to buy them gifts? And they're like, well, yeah, yeah. Do you like to take care of them? Yeah, we love our grandkids. You know, we take care of them. If they were sick, would you do anything for them? Yeah, we would, right? If, if they were going to die and you had the opportunity to die in their place, would you die for your grandkids? And there, most of the grandparents said, yeah, absolutely, I would die for our grandkids. Then he said, would you be willing then to give up your preferences at church for your grandkids? And that made him pause. Would we, be, would we be willing to give up our preference on music for our grandkids? Our preference on a quiet place for our grandkids so that it could be noisy? Would we be willing, what would we be willing to give up for our, our grandkids? Or our kids for that matter, right? And it just goes to show you, right, that when we reframe it like that, we have the opportunity to love on intentionally these kids that, that run around here. And friends, it's okay that it's chaotic at times. It's okay that it's a mess. It's okay that things aren't exactly particularly like we want because guess what? We have an opportunity to influence God's, God's kids in the house of the Lord. And that matters. That matters. That matters to God. Because what did Jesus say? He said, let the kids come to me. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Friends, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Let's love on them well. God, thank you for the kids that you've put here. Thank you for our students who come back here each week. Thank you for our kids that come and sometimes they drag their parents here. Thank you for our teachers who pour into them consistently and show them what it looks like to love Jesus. Thank you for our student leaders who deal with the crazy, deal with the messy, deal with the drama, and show our students what Jesus' love looks like. Thank you for those of in here who pray over our kids. Thank you, for, thank you for women like Grandma Judy and Sandy who just have chosen to love on our kids in, in their own way and how you've gifted them. May we all find ways to, in the way you've gifted us, be an intentional influence in the lives of our kids and our students. So that just like Joash in our story, who was raised up in the house of the Lord and went on to do great things for your kingdom, may our kids be raised up in the house of the Lord with godly influence so that they could go on to do great things for your kingdom. In Jesus' name.